in March, I'm making $20 and in October, I'm making $15 an hour. Plus all the side gigs that I had already either accepted was Midway or you name it. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 238, Finance Friday Edition, where we talk to Joel Esparza about moving to a different country and what is this got? 800 xing his salary. 250 times increase in his salary in seven years. How did I get 800 from that? Math is hard. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen. And with me, as always, is my can bench press way more than I can co-host, Scott Trench. Thank you, as always, for your uplifting introductions, Mindy. Oh, that was a strong introduction. Look at this muscle. That's right. <laughs> Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story, because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, 250 extra salary, or move across the world, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I love today's guest. It is our video editor, who is somebody that we met apparently 100 years ago through Brandon Turner when he posted that he needed somebody to edit some videos. And through his very hard work, he has moved from his home country of Venezuela to Spain, where he is now living his absolutely best life. At, it's actually the beginning of his best life because he has so much potential coming forward. Yeah. And, and this is this is just an incredible we kind of combine the money story and finance friday today um because you have to share joel's money story with this i mean it just it be it, spoiler it, he he starts in venezuela in the turbulent times that they experienced in the in the uh uh 2014 2015 2016 time range with that and overcomes a large number of obstacles to get into you know what I would say is a really strong financial foundation uh, right now. This is this is a the type of position that Mindy and I uh, would typically, you know, regardless of who is on the show or where they live, say this is this is a strong position where the the individual is ready to begin making meaningful investments with this. And Joel has his sights set on even higher on on building a, a sustainable business with that. Oh, and by the way. Joel is the one who edits all of the video for Bigger Pockets. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it's probably his Andy work on his own show today. If you're watching this, if you watch any of our YouTube videos, it's Joel and a lot, you know, in in part due to his his work and and the great team we've got here, we've been able to really change the amount of quality stuff that we're releasing to our YouTube YouTube channel and seeing some some really valuable stuff come out. So big thanks to him as as a huge contributor to that. Um so with that, uh, that that's that's my um, pitch pouring it on and of of of, uh, of of appreciation for Joel. Joel, you make us look great. So thank you. Before we bring in Joel, I must tell you that the contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice. And neither Scott nor I nor Bigger Pockets are engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should seek your own advice from professional advisors, including lawyers and accountants, regarding the legal, tax, and financial implica implications of any financial decision you contemplate. Joel, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you, Mindy. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Joel, let's jump right in. Let's look at your balance sheet. What is coming in and where's it going? Well, uh, right now I'm making about uh, 4500 a month and my expenses uh, look a bit like this. Uh, I have around $600 on rent. I spend roughly 300 to 400 on food. I have an insurance that it's about $75 and then give or take on hobbies and other expenses, uh, including my cell phone, for example, which is like $20. Uh, I have like other expenses for 250 or so. I also have a son uh, whom I send around $250 as well a month. And I think those are pretty much all the money I spend a month. And Joel, where, where, where do you live right now? I am now in Spain, but I am originally from Venezuela. Okay, so you, you live you live in Spain, and where in Spain do you live? I, I am now in Madrid. I actually got here around two years ago. I um, 
I came here and I applied for a residency, which actually uh, just uh, got approved around a month and a half ago. Awesome. And, and should we should we be thinking about your your financial picture in terms of dollars or should we be using euros or, or what do you think is, is the right way to think about it here? Yeah, it's okay to, to talk in dollars. I, I'm actually converting them and I actually, my income comes in dollars and, and I spend it in euros, which is kind of a weird thing for the accounting, but because every day the, the rate changes and you don't know how much are, are you paying for a dollar. It depends when the transaction actually lands on my account and but yeah, it's it's fine. Okay. Just speaking dollars. Well, great. And, and what's coming in? Well, basically, it's just my salary. That that money is just for the work I do as a as a contractor for Bigger Pockets right now. Okay, great. And and that's that's averaging around forty five hundred a month. Yeah, uh, forty five hundred a month, which kind of spiked to forty eight, and then you know it can it can really vary, uh, but just not not by a much, not by a lot. And what do you have in terms of cash savings or investments? Right. So in savings, I'd say I have around uh, six, fifteen thousand uh, dollars by now. Uh, I'd say for the last three or four months, I managed to save half or more than half of my income. And uh, as an investments, uh, there's just one curious case that we in my family's house in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, we built a uh, we built a room and rented as an Airbnb, which uh, cost around uh, twenty five hundred dollars to put the furniture in, uh, make a bathroom, and all of that thing. Like have it ready to rent, and but that's uh, I, I'm I'm not taking anything of that. If that makes sense, that's sustenance for my parents back in Caracas. Okay, great. So so we've got. 15,000 in cash, and we've got a little bit of ownership in a property um, back in, in Venezuela, but essentially most of your wealth, most of the discussion will be around what to do with the cash at this point or, or additional cash going forward. There are no other incomes coming in at the, at the, at the time. Awesome. And, and is there any debt? There are no debts. No, no student loans, no debts to pay, no other. Yep. Okay. So something, Scott, that we have not been doing is saying hooray and celebrating the fact that he has no debt. And we haven't been celebrating some of our other guests as well. So this is awesome that you're starting off with no debt. That is fabulous. But is that more of a cultural thing? Because in America, it's kind of the culture to have debt. Yeah, I I, I know that in the, in the States, people have to get in debt. <laughs> and in my case, it's kind of curious because I would be in debt if I could, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, I, I would I would be in debt because I would I, I don't know I, I I aspire to own my own home here in uh, in Europe and with my income I, I actually could get a loan but in my current circumstances it's kind of tricky to when you're not when you have not been a taxpayer for at least two years and I also I'm I'm, I'm self-employed uh, in the as a taxes matter here in Spain. And on top of that, I'm not even a taxpayer yet because up, up to a month ago, I was just basically a refugee, a political refugee, if you want to call it that. And so I'm just basically starting my economic life at 33 years old, basically. Well, I, I think it would be good at this point to, to take a step back and we'll get into goals and, and what we can do going forward. But I think it would be uh, good to hear a synopsis of your, your money story here um, because I think I think it will inform a lot of the remarkable journey that you've been through to get to this point and how we proceed going forward with this. Would that be okay? Yeah, uh, yeah, we can do that. So, what did you want me to start? Like uh, after school? Uh... We can start after school. We can start wherever you like. Where, where do you think the journey begins um, from your perspective? I went to school in in Argentina, and while I was studying there, I took a summer job uh, editing video, where. Yeah, basically, I was studying film, uh, film, and and that was like at the entry job that I aspired to have, like to be an editor. I I actually liked a lot photography and being a cameraman, and I did that throughout my school years. But then I saw like this angle of I love computers. I'm a huge computer nerd. I love video games, and being in front of a computer seemed like you know as an easy decision. I already have a lot of those skills from before. 
So I took this job and I don't know, they were paying me around $300-$400 a month back then in Argentina, which was really good, but that work only happened during the summer, three months of work, and that's it. And the rest of the year, I was just a student. Now, you're not from Argentina, right? So this was a move for you? Yeah, yeah. I, I am originally from Venezuela, and I decided to move to Argentina because I could study there, and I had like this backup from my family for for studying there. So it's not like my parents helped me pay it. Ironically, it's it's another crazy story of the family. But basically, I received like an inheritance of around four thousand dollars, which propelled me into Argentina. Like at twenty one, and I knew I was gonna get that money since I was a kid. I guess I should tell this story fully. Um, this is this is an aunt of my dad, so it's like a great aunt. I don't know if you call it call her that. So she, she didn't have any kids and it gets dramatic here. She, she got a term, terminally ill with cancer and she had a lot of money. She was a painter and, but she loved her nephews and her grandnephews. So she set it up in a way where all her grandnephews, which were seven, eight of us would receive a portion of this inheritance that she had. And she decided even, she's a champion. She decided even to not even really treat her affliction and just faced death like a champion. And well, and all of us seven nephews, I was like, I don't know, five, six years old when this happened. And I was like the youngest one at the time. I was the last one to receive this inheritance. And all my older brothers and some of my cousins received this as well, like eight of us. And I knew it, she set it up like a trust fund for when you're 21. So as soon as I turned 21, I actually quit my, the career that I was studying in Caracas. And I just decided to move to Argentina and I lived with that money for a really long time. Awesome. And, and, and what year is that? That's 2009. Okay, so in two thousand nine, you're you're in Argentina. You've you're studying film. You're making three four hundred dollars a month. What happens? What happens next? Well, after I graduated, I returned to Venezuela, where things were really really bad. Like economically, it was really hard to get an actual job. And I was gonna have a son in a I don't know in an unplanned way. It was not like a conscious plan of having a child, and we build that relationship or anything. And and well, that, that actually fueled me to start working again, but I was in Venezuela now and I had a partner, she was pregnant and we were going through all of this. So like up to that point, my life was like sort of a fairy tale. And then it came crashing down because, you know, the best paying job that you could get at that point was, I don't know. Very, very few amount of dollars a month, which turned out, for example, I ended up working for my, for my, the, the mother of my child's father. He had like a company of taxis and he set up a car for me and I would go down to the airport and pick people up. And that was actually one of the highest paying jobs, unironically, that you could get at the time. I was getting, I don't know, for going down to the airport and coming back at around $30 and I could get like two or three of those a week. So that actually put me in a very high percentile of people of income earned in Venezuela because I was making, I don't know, $90 a week at that point. But that didn't last for long because, you know, even that job started to, you know, fade out. What, and what year are we in right now? We're talking about this. So you, you, you're 21, you moved to Argentina. What, what time period are we in right now? I stayed in Argentina for around four years. And then I came back to Venezuela around 2014, 2015. Yeah. Okay. And, and at this point, you're saying two to three $30 trips puts you in the top income earner bracket. Yeah, because I was making dollars, not the local currency. So that actually, you you would laugh at this anecdote. At the time, my family ha has this house and it was not built. Half of it no, was not finished. And they had they only recently, before I came back from Argentina, they had put the roof on the on the top part. It was the the, the whole foundation was built, 
And without a roof, we lived there for, I don't know, 15 years or something. And when I came back from Argentina, I come and I see this fantastic roof. And then when, well, you're going to be a dad, uh, happened. Well, we just had to put together around $500, $600. And we built a very nice place for us to live up there with just that money, which actually seemed like, you know, a big debt, stuff that was very controversial, like, building this place it took a lot of effort because fine sourcing seven hundred dollars where when uh, you're living in a place that minimum wage is i don't know five two dollars three dollars minimum wage i'm not even kidding it, so it was like a huge milestone to manage to build that home what what was the general what what, what, what I, I i you know we're getting a picture of it from the stories you're talking about here, but what was it like to go from 300 or $400 a month to, I, I guess you're, you're, you're earning around a similar amount with two to three trips. So, but 60, 200, 250 to $300 a month in Venezuela. Well, it's really different because in, in Venezuela, it was really hard to actually spend the money even. So life was really, really harder than it was back in Argentina. In Argentina, I had some government breaks, uh, I could buy dollars at a cheaper price. Uh, so that, that money that my aunt left me lasted me for literally four, five years throughout college. And then when I come, I'm literally, I'm poor. I'm poor. I don't have any money in, I, I don't have any money. You just, you know, you cannot pay things. You cannot afford basically anything, even buying that house, it came with loans and that I paid off as I did the trips and stuff like that. So how, how long did this continue for? It sounds like this is 2014, 2015. Um, how long does that continue for? For about a year, for about a year until my son was born. And a, a bit before he was born on October, 2015, let's say August, something like that. I landed a job at, a, at an agency that didn't really pay me a lot. They pay me around $20 a month, $30 a month. But that was, at least it was around my expertise and it would grow me. It was a really good agency. And they, they had like the, this onion style of, uh, of journalism uh, was one of their angles. And it really excited me, you know, personally to work at that place. And I just took it because it was stable and it was actually, I felt like it would take me somewhere else rather than, you know, drive a cab. And this is, this is doing video editing. Yes. That was doing video editing. And how much did they pay you one more time? They gave me something on, actually they didn't pay me in dollars at the, at the very beginning. I'd say in the local currency, I was making around the equivalent of $20, even 15 at some points due to inflation. And then we would cry and adjust the rates and take it back to 20 in local currency, of course. And this is $20 per month. Yeah. Yeah. You're hitting it right. It's per month is you wake up every day. You have to be at an office at eight. So you have to be at the, at the subway at seven or something. And you return home 7.30 p.m. So it's not that eight-hour shift. It's a lie. It's actually 11 hours of your day, basically, just between the whole thing, uh, Monday through Friday, the whole month of pay $20 in local currency. Oh, my, oh my gosh. Can you that's live a, off that's... that? I'm telling you, I was one of the lucky ones. I was, you know... I had money to go buy a hamburger and watch Game of Thrones on Sunday and stuff like that, that regular people couldn't do because, you know, it was, if you're in Venezuela, if you're working in a regular job, you're gaining, I don't know, $5. Let's be really optimistic at the time, right? I, it has changed a lot since it, the economy there has dollarized and it's really different now. But So this is 2015. How long does this continue for the $20 a month period? Around two years, around two years, and I started, you know, I, I, the job went well and I built relationships and in Venezuela, there's, you know, I guess everywhere uh, in the, uh, and in this industry, people, they all know each other and you start making friends with everyone that works there and their friends. And then somebody needs a video editor, right? And they say, oh, well, hire Joel that he works at our, our agency, just call him. 
And that was basically the key to that started to make me step up. I, I landed into this job with a lot of necessity, let's call it, or urge, or I don't know, drive to get that money and get that safe money month after month. But after a while that things started to cool down and I had this job and I started to, you know, money, having that little money that you need was not the issue. I started, you know, lifting my head and I started looking for these little gigs online and, you know, accepting these recommendations and freelance. When I came back from home, from work, I would sit down and edit more for somebody else that paid me in one sitting in a couple hours two or three times that I would make in the whole month. So that's how eventually I shifted out of this job and and became a freelancer online and, and a contractor. And that's how it evolves from there. And that, that, that shift is occurring in 2017? Yes, around 2017, yeah. Okay, so what happens next? You're switching out, you're, you're in this path to getting freelancer. How does that evolve? And, and how do you kind of come to arrive in Spain? Well... One night I was playing video games and I met a dude that had a project and I told him I was pitching myself all over the place. And actually a guy that I randomly met online playing video games or one day asked me like, how do you imagine yourself making $10,000 a year? And I cried, dude. And I just, I was so much to imagine making $10,000 a year. My best testament at the time is not making 500 so we started working together. We did a couple projects and he paid me like, I don't know, $150 for a video. And I, so that shifted my whole perspective towards the agency, towards my fixed job, because I said, well, I could just send that out the window and start making five times more. And funny enough, it happened. I quit and Two weeks after I quit, I'm focused on these new projects and these little things that are actually paying me more. I have a lot of more time on my hands. And the agency calls me and starts paying me per video that I did like two a week or one a week. They started paying me $250 for each video. The same company that was paying you $20 a month is now paying you $200 a week? 200 yes. per video. Or $200 a video? 250 per video. <laughs> Yeah, the, the 50 is important. You caught, you caught on fast. Yeah, they started because they didn't have anybody and I quit mid project. It was a huge project. It was an animation project that needed, you know, a lot of attention. I had the hang of it and I quit midway and they were on the need, you know, and who are they going to call? And they called me back and I gave them that rate and they accepted it. So now I'm, you know, I'm balling. <laughs> <laughs> i love it all right so 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 this this is a huge turn of events 2017 is is you know you're, you're not making you're not making 10 times more you're making 20 times more um than you were previously or you're making even more than 20 times more than you were previously you just thought you could make 10 10 000 a year with that so how, how do things go from there now that you're balling. There's one funny one that was also happened right before quitting. One day, uh, my producer comes in and tells me, well, Joel, um, I know you're really busy, dude. So can, do you think we can take this project? And they, they brief me on this video that we need to do. And, and I'm like, dude, you know, we, do you know how we are? We cannot, I don't have the time for this. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll contract it. I'll contract it off. And then I'm home and I receive a phone call from, a, from, a, from some friends that have a production company, an audio video production company. And, and he tells me, look, I have this project. And, and he briefs me on the project. And it's the same project. And I ask him, how much could you pay me for this? Because I know which project this is. They pitched this to me this afternoon. Well, we can pay you $100. And I was like, wait, what? So the project that I rejected got contracted to you and you can pay me five months of salary for one video. So I came on fire the next day and that's the day basically that I quit. And that's the story that I just told you. That was like the final straw of the, of my patience with that. And so, yeah, after that, I just, I won. And, and this is something that would be awesome for other freelancers or people that are, you know, 
hustling online for jobs and, and that kind of stuff. I went into two, two pages that really helped me. One is Fiverr and the other is um, Upwork. Both were recommended by this friend that I met online one night playing video games. He told me like, man, you should really get into these pages and start advertising your job. And well, I landed my first contract, big contract on Upwork. Uh, they were, pay this is seven, 2017 as well. This is October of 2017. Uh, this company named uh, Nameless uh, and they, they were paying me $15 an hour by October of that year, that same year. So it all snowballed so fast during those four months. And by in, in March, I'm making $20 and in October, I'm making $15 an hour. Plus all the side gigs that I had already either accepted was midway or you name it. Love it. All right. So 2017. Now, now you're making fifteen, twenty dollars an hour. That's thirty to forty, thirty, you know, thirty to forty thousand annualized. Um, you're probably not getting all of those hours filled up, but it's still five, ten, twenty, thirty times the amount that you were making just six months previously with that. Um, what, what, what happens to your lifestyle and and your day to day, your, your day to day living during this period? Well, he bought that chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, that's part of it. I, I not, not, not a lot, man. I just, I help my family, you know, fix the cars and fix the house and paint the house and, and improve the, my, my, my own little apartment inside the house got a 40 inch TV and a new couch and a nice mattress. And I had a coffee machine for, I bought a coffee machine for myself. And then my mom was like, Oh my God. And I was like, I bought one for her. Uh, so yeah, I just, not, not, nothing really crazy. It was just, you know, put into our lives that, you know, we, we really, and I saved a lot of it. I took, I took a trip as well, you know, not, nothing too crazy. I only spending, I guess that's what you're hearing. Happy spending for me. Yeah. I mean, th th those things would be, you know, necessity, most people would call those needs or necessities here in, in you know, in, in the USA with with that. So I, I, I think that, um. That, that makes perfect sense with that. So, okay. So we're, we're making, we're in this place in 2017. Things have changed dramatically. What happens next? How does the story continue from there? Well, eventually uh, me and the mother of my child separated and they moved to Belgium. And this is about year 2019 or uh, beginning like January of 2019. And well, that year uh, actually coincided with me, with that client, Nameless, which was paying me $15 an hour. They, due to Facebook monetization issues, uh, stopped uh, uh, monetizing and they, well, they had to fire everyone and the, the honeymoon lasted for like four months. And, and well, it was a really hard, hard, hard month of that January and my kid went to Belgium and I just stopped getting the payout. I, at first I thought, well, I, I can make that trip now it doesn't really matter. I can make the trip, but then it became like, oh, well, I lost the client and I kept searching online or work, applying to everything. And then I saw a post from this one guy, Brandon Turner, and he's asking for this. Uh, he needs a small video edit thing. And I apply and I get a reply after like a couple of weeks. And we start working together and then I, I got another client, uh, yoga people, and I, I like yoga and I, I saw it as a way of getting paid for going to yoga class rather than paying for the yoga classes. So now, so I took those two jobs and both of them started growing really fast, especially the bigger pockets one within a couple of weeks, Brandon got really annoyed by the constant messages that I send them asking him details of what to do, what not to do. By then we were only working through like sending direct messages to coordinate the task. It was hell. And he tells me like, now you're going to talk to this guy to talk to Kevin, Kevin for who's watching is the senior producer now and talk to Kevin. I don't, you know, he will handle everything. And through <laughs> Kevin, we both know Brandon. So this is pretty, uh, pretty spot on for him. <laughs> So he puts me in contact with Kevin and we started working 
you know, building stuff up, uh, may, uh, doing a lot more video editing. At first, they just, need, they just needed like videos for Instagram. And then they needed the whole podcast edited. And then they wanted to do a second podcast and then a third podcast. And now we're up to, I don't know, eight podcasts. And then other videos, uh, we call them SEO videos. But I guess the, the videos were Mindy's, for example, teaching people how to use their, how to, handle their finances or, you know, and it started to grow from there. And it started as a $100 a week job. And well, over the course of building the relationship with you guys and, and three years, it got up to yeah $4,000 a month, basically. And it's gone up. As everyone I'm sure that is watching this video, uh, I think you'll edit your own video here, most likely. Uh, Joel with, the, with this or any of the other videos that we do, um, you know, you, you just do a great job for us and it's, it's been, it's phenomenal and, and it's been incredible to see the growth of our YouTube channel and all this, this other stuff, uh, since you've, you've become a part of the, the organization here. So thank you for all you do for us, um, with that. And, and I think it's, uh, well-deserved. We're, we're thrilled to have you, um, um, helping us out with all this stuff. So thank you. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity and thank you, Brandon as well, if you're watching this. And just as a shout out, I had a, I had a chance to to meet with you, you know, maybe like six months ago about um, just kind of get to know you and, and, and hear about some of the, the work you've been doing for us. And I got a chance to observe Joel at work doing live video edits. It is incredibly impressive. It's happening at four times speed. There's this move, all these things moving around. He's, you know, making us look good at, at late. It's just, it's just incredible to see you go to work on that kind of stuff. Um, all right. Well, that's that, we have plenty of comp, comp, compliments there. Joel does a great job for us. Let's go back to the Finance Friday part of this, though. What? How can we best help you? What are your goals today, and how can we help you with your your finances? Right now, I'm. I, I find myself that I just I have like this mattress where I put my money under, and then Mindy's gonna hate me for this, <laughs> but then we took Not like. Hate. Fi- Gonna gonna correct me a lot about this next point. We put like I don't know five hundred dollars in crypto, wishing that it would turn into millions of dollars at some point, uh, which is not you know something that have ha, has had any result at all. And I'm just piling this money up, and and I have you know I I, I have doubts about how to actually grow outside working eight hours a day and building the relationship with the, with you, with you, uh, you are my client as I be bigger pockets is my client and the, my relationship with bigger pockets is growing, but also the opportunity to get more clients and work for more people and put people under me has started to arise recently, uh, be a bigger pockets as well that you have had needs of finding assistance, getting more people in because the amount of work that we're doing is increasing. So of course, one person cannot handle everything. So recently I started a partnership which has not yet come to final, to full fruition, but it's, it's finalized in verbal terms of building a, yeah, this relationship with a, with a partner that he has equipment and he has cash that he could use for hiding people uh, or at least covering the, the expenses of our employees or assistants or whatever you call it, subcontracts. And and he can cover that. And I'm bringing to this partnership uh, th- this client, Bigger Pockets, uh, and the opportunity of keep using my reputation on these websites where I have very good reputation as a contractor throughout these years, uh, billing all this time, having these long-term contra- uh, contracts puts you in a really good position to get new clients. So I'm, I'm in this verge of I can now grow. And instead of being that guy pushing bottoms like the cat from the meme, you know, smashing the <laughs> bottoms, I can now have people and build the systems, which is something that I've, I've been learning and, and, you know, start having more money and doing less work, which is what it, I feel is going to be the first step th- towards, you know, me 
leverage leveraging my money to get a, get into a better position. So that's basically that's my questions. It's about building this partnership and how to use this money that is coming in and how to best invest it maybe. So it's, it sounds like the biggest goal is is you don't really have you're not you're not saying I want to be financially free in five years. You're saying I want to. I'm in a great spot right now. I want to build a business that becomes profitable and begin scaling my operation here. Is that is that the right way to frame your objective? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And you know, so the first thing that I would you know that comes to mind here is you. Um, well, let me ask you this. How how would you rate yourself in terms of the skill set of, of editing video with that? Are, would you think that you're a, a, one of the best in the world or, or highly skilled at that? Do you feel like you can have you're able to spot people who are as skilled or or close to um, in skill set to you? I guess I, I could be. I, I I guess I'm capable of knowing if someone is better than me. Absolutely, and I could easily spot somebody that does amazing work. And I can appreciate a, a video well edited. And as a video editor myself, I'd say I am I am really fast, which has always been like my upside. And I have a good turnaround, and I work cleanly. Uh, I but I, I I would not claim at all to be one of the top video editors of the world at all. Um, I I'd say I, I'm a pretty skilled video editor. But the skills that I that I find myself that I that I see that I will need are not something that I've trained as much as you know the shortcuts of Adobe Premiere or something like that. So I find myself really lost of how to handle the whole thing and how to you know actually build a team or or take the financial risk of you know paying them. So perfect. So I think I think the first thing we got to start with is what's the value proposition of your business and your value proposition of your business. It sounds like is it's going to be on time, solid work, very very fast, and and you're able to are those are those kind of the value the the, the two or three most important things or what what would you say your firm or you how would you articulate it in three bullet points. That you have confidence in the, that the job is being handled and there's a responsible person on the other side of the screen. There's something that I love doing in my day-to-day -day job that is making people know that I'm there. And it might seem as obnoxious for some people that are really busy or they don't have time for that. But I think that's how my relationship built with my previous clients and with you guys, it's just that you know that I'm there and I exist, even if I'm in another country, in another continent, in another time zone, uh, your stuff is being taken care of. And I'd say that's one of the, but I, I don't know if that counts as a value proposition, responsibility. And then, yeah, a fast turnaround. What is a fast turnaround? What does that mean? Ha having the skill to work fast on video editing and to understand the, the, the in, in, a, in any creative job, you have this back and forth thing, iteration where you send something and they give you, they give you back feedback. And then you do that feedback on the video and then the video goes back and you start ping pong with that video throughout a lot, uh, a lot of time. But I guess, you know, after all this time, I guess I'm good at understanding the expectations of the client and it's not holding one every time. But I can, it, it can happen that you will feel understood when, at least with me personally, when you're explaining your video needs and your stuff. So I can really build a rapport with my client and, and yeah, go from there. I will say that I am the perfect person to give you advice on this because I am your client. I need your services because I do not possess your skills. And you have amazing skills. You make me look and sound like I know what I'm talking about. So hooray for Joel. What I need and is- And me. <laughs> and Scott. What I need from you as a video editor is a fast turnaround or even more than a fast turnaround, I need an accurate turnaround. If you can't do it for a week, that's fine. I can adjust my recording schedule and get you more stuff so that I can be on your schedule for the next week. What I don't need is somebody who says they can do it tomorrow and then, oh, sorry, I didn't get to it the next day, the next day, the next day. So right now, I think it's globally, there are shortages in supply chain and just in general, nobody wants to work and it's really difficult to get 
any commitments right now. So having a commitment that you can keep is going to just move you to the top of everybody's list because you are so awesome. Doing a great job, of course, is, you know, the best part. But not only do you do a great job, you can do it when you say you're going to do it. You, I trust you as the video editor to know that when I'm, you know, I'm, I'm writing and I, I, oh crud, cut that part out. I trust that you'll just cut out that little bit. You seem to be really intuitive. That's what Mindy says is crud. <laughs> Joel's like, no, she doesn't. I've watched her videos. <laughs> oh, Joel liked that one. <laughs> Sometimes I also say shucks and yeah, that's fudge. Right. <laughs> sometimes we have to bleep you though but that, that's fine we, we all need to be bleeped sometimes so the fact that you aren't on the same continent i am doesn't matter you know what you're doing i trust that you know what you're doing and i'm sure this is what brandon did when he first started he's like hey can somebody edit a video for me oh sure i can here's a sample video can you edit that and then he sees he sends you the video he sees what you give give back he watches it oh, that's good. Let me send you another one. If he had watched your first video, he was like, oh, this is terrible. He cut out all the good parts. He probably wouldn't have sent you another one to do. So proving yourself over and over again. And how do you prove yourself to a new client? You do it with testimonials. Hey, this is Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets. Anybody can Google Bigger Pockets. They'll be like, oh, that's kind of a big deal. Um, here's another, co- I don't know all the other companies you work for, but having testimonials from people that you've done business with, here's a list of all the videos. Like here's the bigger pockets, YouTube channel. I did all of those, or I did most of those or what, like however much you've done. Having samples is really, really important because I can watch a video and I don't know how to edit it, but I know it's good. I know it's not good based on the editing. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do with, with this line of questioning is what are the value that the, the, there's value proposition to your business? And what I'm hearing you say is I'm going to acknowledge receipt of an email very quickly. I'm going to resp- give you a clear timetable on when I'm going to get version one back to you. I'm going to reply back to your feedback quickly and iterate. And that cycle time is going to be very important into getting it in and out into production with that. I think that's something that we really appreciate about you, Joel, in addition to your, your skill in editing it. And then it's going to be done at a high quality. And if you can articulate those one or two things, that's what you're looking for in an employee or someone you're subcontracting to. And if you can go and find those those things and say, great, our value proposition, you know, we're going to charge, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you charge per video? What's, what's, a, what, what's a good rate there? If you want a one minute video edited, it will, there's a ton of questions to ask you about what graphics goes in, go in it. How, how many hours of recording do you have? For when do you need this? Because if you need it for tomorrow, I need to work tonight to finish it. Even if it's a one minute video, people tend to overlook that a lot. And a one minute video, you know, advertisements for the, for the, for the Super Bowl. uh, Half time are 30 seconds, and those things can take, I don't know, weeks to, to finalize in post-production. So it really will depend on the level of detail that the project needs and when do you need it. Right now, you, we're, we're your big client, right? Bigger pockets. You want to go out and get additional clients, and you've got a great value proposition and, a great, and, and, and good things to offer with this, right? With those additional clients, you know, they're not going to probably pay you by hour. They're going to probably pay you per job or per video right. with that. Right. And so, and so with that, you know, th- you're, you're, enter- you're, you're saying Scott and Mindy, my goal is to build a services business, uh, in the next couple of years here, a services business that provides the service of video editing for clients, probably similar in many ways to bigger pockets. Is that is that right? Yeah, it is right. And also building, increasing the relationship with bigger pockets because now the needs of production that are coming soon and, and even right now have have make make it so we need more hands. And some of that came through a recommendation from me five months ago. And now it's going to keep building up. So this person that I recommended that we we are really good friends and we sat down one day and talked about it and we realized that we either have to partner up or 
he's going to become my competition of sorts. And we want to partner up because it's going to take us farther away, farther. So even with bigger pockets, we want to keep absorbing that. But yeah, keep having constant people that can work for different clients and how to shift myself from being the one pushing the keys to the one that's building relationship with the clients and bringing them in. So the first thing you need to understand in this, and what I'm trying to build towards is the concept of unit economics. Okay. So this is, what do I make per job on these types of things? So suppose that you're saying I have a set of videos or a video and the cost that I'm going to charge the client is going to be $250 for that, that work, right? You know, that, that, you know, from there, you have to be able to gather the requirements that make sense for that, for, for that client, and then hire somebody else to perform the actual work of editing the video. And you have to be left with a profit at the end of that job, right? So this would be, this would be a client that is not a bigger pockets that is not, you know, has an endless amount of work. This would be somebody with a one-off job with that, right? And so you'd say, okay, great. I'm, I'm going to charge $250 and I then need to have somebody else do that work. And what am I going to pay them? I'm probably going to pay them per hour, right? I could also, you know, you could theoretically say, I want to pay per job. Um, but now, now you're just taking, doing what your old, your old firm did. And you know that you're going to create an incentive for your, your team member to leave with, with that type of stuff. So what you want to say is, but you have to boil it down to unit economics here. And you say, okay, great. If I could charge 250 and I can gather all the requirements and then get it produced for 150 by another editor, I make a hundred dollars in profit, right? Now, some of that's going to be my time and gathering the requirements and sourcing the job and those types of things, but there will be a profit between that, that arbitrage, right? You do that 10 times and there's a thousand dollars in profit. You do it a hundred times, there's $10,000 in profit. But as you move towards a hundred times, you have enough work to have somebody full time. So you no longer have to pay them per unit of production. You can now pay them per hour as a full time or part time employee with this kind of stuff with a with a guaranteed rate, and that is where you begin to scale the business model, right? Because many people cannot go out there and perform this model on their own because they can't get enough two hundred and fifty dollar jobs to make a good living. So a full time job is a better thing because they don't have the reputation, for example, that you may have built on this platform or whatever with that. And so what I'm trying to introduce is, hey, you need to understand what your value proposition is. Find somebody who can deliver on that value proposition as a potential subcontractor, understand the unit economics and start per job, and as quickly as possible, scale that into a situation where you feel comfortable having a full-time employee and there's enough work where now you can make that, that, that jump where, okay, I know I'm going to get you know 50 jobs a month and that's going to be plenty for one full-time person. And then the next person, I'm going to begin for person number two, and I'm going to also pay them per job um, on this. Um, and, and that's a lower risk for your clients in a lot of cases, because they don't have to do the risky work of and the hard work of finding a good contractor fit, right? Um, you know, like, like we did a, a few years right. ago w with you. So you're, you're just saying, I'm going to guarantee this value proposition. You're going to get what I deliver with that. And I'm going to, I'm going to oversee it and make sure that, that the, the folks in my organization do that. And I'm going to move into that by thinking in terms of unit economics. And then as soon as I have enough volume hiring somebody and then having the overflow go to the next person with unit economics and then hiring them and then bringing the next, and, and, and it will never work out that cleanly in real life, but that's a framework from which to think about this. And that would not require you to have a lot of cash or capital most likely to do this. That would be my guess. Yeah. I, I, I think it makes me nervous to start, you know, trusting other people. I guess I'm so used to just doing the thing and getting paid out there. It, there's a comfort on it. And through all the story that I just told you as well, it suddenly the idea of dividing my income and coordinating other people seems like, you know, it, it just, it scares me basically. I, I feel like it, it, it require it will require like a sort of leap of faith that I will have to invest pro possibly money into their salary to, and I even think about this. In what time will I have to work? I, I have to work more 
to get those clients now while also delivering still to my current client. So it, it, I'm seeing that I have to do also an investment of time, which I've become really jealous about it because with all of this that I've done, I've, I've, you know, I've had the opportunity to grow on my hobbies and my free time a lot. So I've started to, you know, just be confident on a night to find job uh, as of sorts, if that makes sense. Joel, if you came in and said, my goal is to build wealth and be, you know, build a couple hundred thousand dollars in net worth or a million dollars in net worth and become financially free in the next 10 years, we might not have been talking about this business model and having to trust this because you save a tremendous amount of money. You've got some savings. You can begin investing um, according to the approach we talk about on Bigger Pockets Money a lot all, for a lot with in, in index funds or buy a house hack or a home or those types of things. Those are great approaches to build wealth. You told us, I want to build a business. You want to build a business, you're going to have to do this kind of stuff and it's going to be hard. You're going to have to trust somebody else to do that work. You're going to have to coordinate those activities. And the first few times you do it, let's say the first 10 jobs, if you could have done them yourself by just working a few extra hours and made the entire 250, if you if you believe my example with that. And instead, you're only going to make 100 on each of those jobs. And so you're going to be working more than you are right now to train somebody up uh, at least in the initial stages, and making less for a time. But if you can get the model right, then your business may be able to grow. So that is, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is not. This is going to take you six months to a year uh, to, to to figure out and and get right and tweak. Um, but if you want to build a scalable business, you may you have to apply a model to that effect or something else that will probably involve a similar amount of work to begin getting there. So I think I think that's exactly the right hesitation to have there. You can get rich uh, without doing this, but if you want to build a business, this is one way to, I, I, th I think you're, you're, it's not, you're not gonna be able to have your hobbies uh, and your free time and build a big business at the same time, at least in the early days, most likely. Well, so another point to make is that you don't have to hire 47 people tomorrow. I think you should take a page from Brandon's, how Brandon first met you and throw something up on Fiverr. Hey, can somebody edit a video for me? You don't have to say you're hiring for somebody. You can just ask if somebody can edit a video for you and see who's good, see who could be good with a little bit of guidance from you and see who is just complete garbage and you never want to hire them again. And, you know, you said that you have, uh, did you say you have $15,000 saved up? Earmark a hundred of that and see what you can find. And if you can find one really awesome Joel from 2015, who needs a little bit of guidance or who just needs jobs, then you can start to release your workload. And like Scott was saying, this is going to take some time. You're going to have to actually show them, give them the raw video, watch the raw video, watch their edit and see how you would have changed things. Oh my goodness. This is almost exactly what I would have done. It's probably not going to be the first response you have to the very first video that you hire, but Maybe there's something there. And like you said, you can tell who's good and who's not good and who's got some some potential just because of your skill. And, you know, if you can hire somebody for ten dollars an hour from Venezuela who feels like they're making a billion dollars a minute because they're only making, you know, twenty dollars a month or whatever. I know that that was in 2015, 2017, when Venezuela was a little less stable. They had rampant inflation, if I recall correctly. You're right. Yeah. You know, that particular time when somebody said, I'll give you, what was it, $20 for a whole video? You're like, really? That's my whole month's salary. Of course, I'm going to do that. The people that you're finding that have the skills that are living in countries that may have a lower cost of living than where you're at will be so excited at the money that you are giving them. It's worth the opportunity. It's worth the chance to to test it out and see if you can find somebody. Maybe you just find one person from that video. But now that person can come in and maybe they can do a raw edit and then you go down and and do the final edit. That'll still save you a lot of time. And I'm, you know, talking about this like I know what I'm talking about. I don't edit videos ever. So I have no idea how many times you go through it. Yeah, this is going to be an investment, right? So one way or another, you're going to have to invest. You, you, you make money with your time, right? And and anytime you're not spending editing editing is time that you're not making money, right? That's that's the nature of, of, of a contract role with, with these kinds of things. And so you're going to have to invest time outside of that to train somebody else or to observe them or to review their work, uh, especially in the early days. 
And that investment may pay pay off or it may take three, four, five times before it does pay off uh, with that kind of stuff. But I think that is that is the entry point to building a business. The good news is that you have a niche that you know seems reasonably defendable. You've got a good skill set. You've got a good reputation on these websites that are the, the key to attracting business um, with that. So you have some you have some advantages that to me suggest that an experiment here may be, may be worthwhile because you don't have to invest 15 grand to do this. You don't have to invest probably a few hundred or a few thousand and a few and and a number of hours of your time. My first thought about that was find uh, ideally finding somebody that would hone the client for me. That would go and approach this client and and get into the websites and actually filter the things. But now that speaking to you, I think that possibly what I need more is this, yeah, another editor who I can, who I can pass down the jobs to. And me building the relationships with the clients and me finding my, I was just being, you know, selfish with my time because yeah, now that I'm okay, that I'm doing okay with money. I get to, you know, all the things about hobbies and free time that are so rewarding and, you know, going to sleep and just working a set amount of hours. But I guess if you want something, you have to give something back, right? I have to invest my time, which is my most valuable asset as you are suggesting. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think that's the, exactly the right way to think about it. And like you, you are doing great right now. You're, you're saving a ton of money with that. I would also heavily encourage you to, to form an investing strategy. Cause I don't think you're going to need a lot of cash to, to, to at least at first to really move some things here. You may, um, but you have a good emergency reserve. I'd encourage you to start thinking about how am I going to invest outside of my business? in stocks, in real estate, or in other things that, that are interesting to you um, with that. Because if you did not build this business, I think you could still build a tremendous amount of wealth over the next five, 10 years by putting together a good investment approach and beginning to to put that money to some risk, but but with the chance of, of, of it growing over here with that, like we talk about a lot on, on BP Money and, and, and Bigger Pockets generally with that. So I'd encourage you to do that as well, even though that wasn't a topic that you came as sta stating as one of the goals here, because you're in perfect position to do that. Everything is going right to to begin investing in, from, from what I'm seeing here. Well, I've thought about buying uh, investment, uh, an investment property, and that's one of my I, side plans, I guess, uh, to use as I build a relationship with a bank and I have like this economic track in Spain and in a couple of years, I will be able to get a loan and, and get a first, uh, my first home and house hack it or, or just, you know, put somebody in there that pays the mortgage and some change for me. And now even my rent is cheaper, whatever I rent. And now this home is paying itself. Uh, that's also a plan. But that's not something that really excites me that I would like to talk to you about buying a house, which is something really exciting, to be honest. But I really like what I do. So I want to grow that instead of that other plan, which also will exist for, for sure. M makes sense to me. But yeah, I think I think the uh, the good or bad news, depending on what, you, what you're thinking there, is I don't think it's a financial investment. I think it's a time investment to grow your, your current business and that that time will be... And every moment you're spending doing that is time that you couldn't, you're not able to actually be generating dollars from an editing uh, standpoint, but that may pay off huge for you over the next five, 10 years. If you're able to crack that code and willing to invest it, I think it will be harder than we're making it out to sound. I think it will, I think it'll take a few hundred or a few, you know, maybe a, a thousand or two hours to really kind of crack the code and build a, a sustainable business with that. Um, but it, that could be absolutely well worth it with that. Mindy, what do you think? So I'm seeing his brain as the main asset of the company. If he's not able to do his editing, there's not a lot. How do I say this without sounding mean? There's not a lot else in the company right now. So if you can take your brain and kind of shift that to somebody else's brain so they can do the editing, then you can be focusing on finding more clients or once somebody can do the editing for you or the bulk of the editing for you, you can focus on finding somebody who can find you more clients. I think there's a lot of opportunity for delegation and just hiring out 
your brain, sections of your brain to other people so you can focus on different things. And sometimes focusing on different things includes taking time off. And I think, uh, do you know Dave Visaya? Yeah, I know him. Yeah, I would talk to Dave because he's built a, should we call it fairly successful business? He's got Very a, successful. Yeah, he's got a podcast editing business himself. So he's going to be a really good person to chat with about that. Plus, he's super giving. He's so nice. Yeah, I, I work with him a lot and we chat a lot. And I, you know, that, that's an advice that I would follow 100%. He, he's done what you're trying to do. Yeah. So so just for those listening, Dave Visaya, uh has been a part of Bigger Pockets, um, the Bigger Pockets family for a long time. Uh, I would I would say over 10 years at this point or, or close to it. And he started out kind of doing a lot of the work that very similar types of work that Joel does for us, but in editing our podcast audio um, with that. And um, he has built a large contracting business, editing audio for many podcasts at this point. Um, and we remain probably one of his large clients today. And I think has been very, very successful. We should probably invite him on the show sometime if you would like to to share some of the, 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 the uh, that, that success. But he would be a perfect person to talk to and, and somebody that you, you interact with already with that. And absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, to some degree, somehow he has done, he has articulated what I was trying to articulate in a much more professional and, and clear cut way for, for that process. And, and but I, I want to highlight that word, though. You're right. Mindy is absolutely right. The primary asset of your business is your brain right now. And you need to translate that from your brain to your process. That's the word, right? Is what is your process for editing video? What is your process for responding to clients? What is your process for uh, making sure that those things get right? What is your process eventually for hiring? What is your process for getting business? That kind of stuff. You don't have any of those processes documented, I bet. But it's because of those processes that you do is is why we we enjoy working with you with that. So that so my my advice would be process. What is it that you're doing? That you know, I I'm responding. I'm I'm on I'm on my computer at, at lots of times, especially during business hours for the client. Um, and maybe I'm not even always working during those because it's not part of my business day. But I'm there. I'm quick. I'm going to respond quickly with these types of things and turn these things around when there is an emergency request or whatever. With that, I'm going to have. This is how I edit the video. I do it with this software. I do it at this pace. I do it in this style. I inform the client that they need to have a stop sign when we say shucks inappropriately in the middle of the video uh, or a hand wave in front of the camera to make sure that that's a chance to stop. And, and I know I can visually see the edit marks. All of those are your process that you've kind of trained us on um, to a large extent over, over time with this, you know, and, and putting that into putting that into a documented fashion and training somebody else on it, that translates the asset from your brain to your process, which is something that can scale. That's fantastic. That's really good advice. Yeah. I will, I will a hundred percent do the homework on this. This is I guess you just need to be brave as well to just take the leap. Sometimes uh, you have to, you know, give it a shot, I guess. Well, spoiler alert, we plan to do a lot more video here at Picker Pockets. So, you know, we, 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 we uh, I think we would love to, uh, the, the, the Joel process to continue. So, <laughs> yeah, if you need more work. Scale. Jokes aside, that's part of the motivation. That's how I stand. That's how I, I came to know my partner. He's like best friend of my girlfriend. And, at some point, some months ago, we needed some more people and I recommended him rather than subcontracting him and taking the step at the time. I was thinking as bigger pockets as, as my employer rather than my client. And that's what I was sort of aspiring at. And now that I see actually I was wrong in, in, in the main way was that I, I was shortcutting myself by doing that. I should have at that time done that. And thankfully I recommended someone which for, with that I know for a long time that we have tremendous trust. And then he came up to me as well and said, well, we should partner up before we start competing. And instead of competing, we can do so much more together. And, and well, that's how this whole idea started forming up. And yeah. What one book recommendation I have for you is called the E-Myth Revisited. 
or the E Myth. You can read the original, but there, there's it's been uh, updated with the E Myth revisited. So it's by Michael Gerber, and it's been quoted by a number of guests over the years in the Bigger Pockets Money and Bigger Pockets Real Estate podcasts. And I think that would be a really helpful read to kind of reinforce some of the things that we just talked about with this. But it sounds like this was helpful for you, and this is what you were hoping. To, you know, we, we were able to add. You know, answer some of your questions today. Absolutely, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well. Mindy, should we go ahead and wrap up here? This was a lot of fun, Joel. I'm super excited that you were able to join us today because I am excited for your prospects. I think that it's going to take a little bit of time to get going, but once you get going, it's just going to snowball. We haven't had anybody on the show who has been earning, who went from earning $20 a month to, to you know, the, the 4000 a month uh, that we heard we heard today or, or plus, and, and now opportunity to grow a business with this. So this is, this is our, our most, I, I think that the biggest, most dramatic change, uh, in, in circumstance that we've ever had on the bigger pockets of money podcast. It's a privilege to have you on the show and it's been a, it's a privilege to work with you, Joel. So thank you for all you do. And thank you for sharing. Wow, guys, I'm, I'm really flattered <laughs> and I will not get it, not let it get to my head. I promise you but I feel like I'm just beginning. So I really thank you for your encouragement and for your trust and for all this opportunity. And I'm sure this, this is going to be a turning point as well. So thank you a lot. I think we're right here on your hockey stick growth. I think you're about to go nuts. Very crazy with the, with the growth. Is that a That's phrase? You're right. Is that a phrase? Hockey stick growth? Have you heard that before? There's not a lot of hockey playing in the Caribbean or in the tropical <laughs> countries. I totally okay, understand your point. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. fair. <laughs> okay, that's well, awesome. Joel, I will talk to you in a few minutes when I send you more video, raw, raw video to edit and bleep out. You got it, Mindy. Count on it. Okay, thank you, Joel. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, that was Joel. From all the way from Spain. Thank you, Joel, for joining us today. Scott, what did you think of Joel's story? After we were done recording, we ch chatted for a few minutes and I'll, I'll share this here. I, I think it reminds me of episode 21 in a strange way. The stories are not the same. The circumstances are different, but the, the, the magnitude of the change that Joel experienced in his journey going from $20 a month to 4,500 a month um, in, in a span of, of five, six, seven years and completely over overhauling his lifestyle and, um, his financial position, that magnitude of change reminds me of Tony Gaydon, um, uh, back from episode 21, who, you know, was around four, 400, 450 pounds and had to weigh himself on the scale at Walmart, uh, in order to do that and had 20, 25,000 in credit card debt and was able to knock off 260 pounds and rebuild a financial position of half a million at least at that time. I bet you he's approaching a million um, uh, uh, by the time we're ch chatting now, although we'll have to catch up with him at some point. But that magnitude of change is is, is pretty rare that we've heard on the show, and it's, and it's just unbelievable um, to a large extent. And I'm just excited for what comes next for Joel um, and obviously grateful for the, the great job he does for us. I am super excited for what he's doing. I think that he has a ton of potential. I think his first step is to hire somebody to take a lot of his mental bandwidth out of his head so he can focus on other things and growing those sections to the, the of his business to the point that he can then hire somebody to take that off his plate too. But I think he's got a huge potential for growth. I mean, I don't know if you know this, Scott, but there's this little website called YouTube. That's Y-O-U-T-U-B-E dot com. And, you know, they, they host a couple of videos every once in a while. So what is it? There's a search There's... bar there where you can type in bigger pockets or bigger money. pockets money and, and find some, some, some great content there. <laughs> what is the, how much content is uploaded? Like 52 years worth of content is uploaded every minute or something. I just made that up. I don't know what the statistic is, but it's something enormous like that. Every minute or every second that that there's stuff being uploaded it's like more than you could ever 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 watch so videos going nowhere but up and so is joel's company okay scott should we get out of here let's do it from episode 238 of the bigger pockets money podcast he is scott trench and i am mindy jensen saying carry on the slog dog <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>